Welcome to season four of The Bitey End of the Dog. I'm really excited to be launching 17 episodes with so many incredible conversations centered around the topic of aggression and all of the ways we can help dogs and their people. Many of this season's episodes focus on the human side of aggression cases. And while I didn't actually plan for that, I'm truly happy many of the conversations took a deep dive into understanding why the human element is such a crucial part of dog aggression. In this episode, I have the distinct honor to chat with one of my all-time heroes in dog training, Patricia McConnell. Her work was pivotal in helping me learn more about gentler methods to dog training, and her knowledge, kindness, and generosity will forever be etched into the betterment of humankind. I also want to take a moment to provide an important content warning for this episode. This was one of the most emotional episodes for me to record, and Trisha and I go deep into some very sensitive subjects. We discuss Trisha's book, The Education of Will, and the topics of trauma, abuse, and assault are focused on throughout the conversation. Listener discretion is advised. I also want to note that while we focus much on the human side of trauma in our discussion, we also discuss how trauma impacts dogs and its impact on aggression as well. Hey everyone, welcome to the Bitey End of the Dog. I have an incredibly special guest with me this week, one of my all-time heroes, Dr. Patricia McConnell, who I have to tell some stories about. I always tell stories about the guests Uh before Uh um, we start the show. But my personal story is, you know, I always talk about books or mentors in my life that have really impacted my journey in dog training. But Trisha's probably not aware that two times you've made seismic shifts in my life. No. Yes. Uh, and so they better the, be good. The first one, <laughs> the first one's for, you probably heard many times, you know, so the other end of the leash, not to be confused with the bitey end of the dog, you know. So my good friend Trish McMillan came up with the title, The Bitey Which End of the Dog. Which is a great title, by the way. Isn't it? She's so creative They'll with titles. Love it. I love but, it. but because your book is so iconic, that some people always refer to it as The Bitey End of the Leash oh. instead of <laughs> sort of a funny. play on your, the other end that of the is leash. Funny. <laughs> but. Your book actually was one of the most impactful books in my crossover journey. So the term crossover trainer, you know, shifting from Mm -hmm. using traditional or balanced Mm -hmm. techniques or certain tools. I was turned on to your book by a good mentor of mine, the late Barbara Brill, who really helped me in my crossover journey. She introduced me to your book, to Don't Shoot the Dog, to The Culture Clash, and so on and so forth. And I actually would have never heard of those books if it wasn't for her. So so people think, you know, when you're in the positive reinforcement industry, you kind of, everybody like, of course we know those books but yeah, when you're you when you're starting out you i had no idea i had right. no exposure and um so thanks to them and thanks to you and Thank i was talking you. to a um, good friend and colleague of yours yesterday karen london dr dr london also with you know the books that you have co-authored also was very beneficial you know and looking back i don't want to age us that's you know over almost two decades oh, you, ago you, don't, you don't see this hair see this hair michael you yeah. don't you don't have to say anything <laughs> maybe you but not me <laughs> so it's it's amazing how time flies but yes that that was it's just been so impactful in my journey but then recently i listened to the education of will listen because i, mm. I listen to most of my books now by mm. by audio so on audible the education of will I didn't know what to expect when I was going in. I knew what the book was about, but I didn't realize, again, just how much of a profound impact that would have on me. Mm-hmm. And it's because of, and this is something I don't think I've ever talked about publicly. Some of my very close friends know, but you know, I was in a, in a very abusive relationship when I was younger and didn't realize some of the trauma that I'd experienced then and how much it carried on through my life and the shame you talk about in your book, and then the eventual redemption. And I think just in the last couple of weeks, because I just finished it maybe a week ago, but I'd been kind of listening to it for the last couple of months, something just cascaded over me and and this huge lift of, and and it just all started to make sense to me. Because what I had done, which which is, we're, we're gonna jump into the topic of trauma, is really just actually blacked out a lot of those memories. Like I, I, people will show me pictures or talk about certain times in that, in that time of my life. And I 
cannot recall anything. Yeah. I will look at the picture. Yeah. I'm like, where's that yeah. from? What is that from? Yeah. So yeah, it's just so two times you've already, you've impacted wow. my life in such wow. profound ways. So, so I can't thank you enough and, and welcome to the show. <laughs> well, thank you. And oh, so much to say just about that introduction. And I guess the first one is thank you, is just thank you for honoring us with that story because I mean, how many of us are there? There's just such a massive universal population of people who have been truly traumatized, mm -hmm. you know, no matter what the cause, no matter what it was. But and, and I look forward to talking about trauma and what it really is and isn't in the near future. But one, thank you for sharing that story because it's not always so easy. Thing about you forgetting that's, I mean, I repressed a lot of what happened to me for decades and it wasn't, I didn't forget it, but I never thought about it ever. It's like it didn't exist. And one of my therapists said when I was, it was coming back and I was having a really hard time. I was actually semi-suicidal. I basically called her and said, I don't, I think I can't live with this. I think I'm probably just going to end it. And she said, you know, there's a reason that we were, that we repress things. <laughs> Because they're so hard, you know. But if you have the resources to bring them back, it like you said, it's like a house is taken off your shoulders, you know. So, mm -hmm. so thank you for yes. that, Michael. I'm no. just really, really grateful and good for you. Hey, Michael. Yes, I know. I appreciate you. <laughs> so and, proud and, of you. And, you know, I'm sure you've heard it before. Just how much of an impact you've had on the entire dog training community. So, thank you for all of your work and, and contributions. Thank you. So, speaking of contributions, I'd love to talk about you know your studies and learning about trauma in dogs first. Maybe we talk about the yeah. the, the canine aspect and yeah. probably segue yeah. into to humans as well. So, let's first define trauma because even that that term right. can have different right. meanings. So what is your sort of elevator pitch definition of that? Yeah, yeah. So my preface to the elevator pitch is that I want to live in a world in which we're using words precisely, because mm -hmm. I think trauma, PTSD, you know, stress are being thrown around a lot in ways that I'm, I don't think are helpful. So trauma, the way it's sort of biologically usually defined is it's about a lasting effect of some kind of difficult, distressful event. So it's not about being scared momentarily. Trauma is about changes that may be forever, that may just be long lasting, and usually can be ameliorated or often can be ameliorated, that is a response to something that was very distressful, you know? And, and we know stress is not always bad, right? Stress can be good. Oh boy, I'm getting a puppy. <laughs> um, stress can be really good, but it still can be hard physiologically on the body. Distress is negative stress, right? Mm -hmm. And chronic stress, as we all know, can be very, very hard on us physiologically, neurologically. I, have you seen, Chris, I'm sure you have, Christina Spaulding's new book yes, on, yes. Um, right? Fantastic. On what is it? Stress in dogs. Stress in dogs. Yeah. Stress in dogs. Um, it's so. If anybody hasn't seen it, it's just fantastic. And one of the things she talks about is the profound effect physiologically and the long-lasting effects of stress. So trauma is usually associated with some kind of a discrete event, although it might be there might be several of them, right? Which then actually changes the brain. In PTSD, for example a lot of the brain is actually structurally changed. The, the amygdala, sort of the center of fear and anger, that's highly simplistic, but that's all I could talk about neurology right now is highly simplistic. But that's enlarged and it's hyperactive. The hippocampus, which is a really, really important part of the limbic system, very primal learning, memory, it's, it's decreased in size and function. The prefrontal cortex has changed, the way it communicates with the amygdala. So... When an individual, whether dog or human, and I, I'm sure a lot of the cognitive parts of it are different, but the basic physiology of it is not between any mammal, including us and dogs and horses, and right? Mm -hmm. Those long-lasting effects have, have, or changes have big, big effects on animals' responses. And as you know, as well as anybody in the world, aggression is a common response to an overactive amygdala, right? And a damaged prefrontal cortex and a diminished hippocampus. 
And, and that's what I want to kind of dive into next is that aggression aspect. So, mm-hmm. you know, obviously we focus on aggression in this podcast, but how do we know or how, because we see that, you know, we hear that from our clients sometimes. I think he's been through some trauma or abuse or something. Right. And how right. can we as practitioners or even as some pet guardians listening in know what, you know, because sometimes we don't, right? But how, what are some ways of us right. telling that a dog has been through something traumatic? Yeah, that oh, that's such a good question, and I agree with you. We, you know, we can't ever know. Sometimes we just can't. You know, one of the ways I found was just taking a lot of time in the interview. So here's a classic case, and I'm sure you see this, and all the trainers and behaviors out there see this all the time. There's a dog who has been relatively relaxed, pretty, you know, within the normal confines of normal dog behavior for years, and then gradually starts, say, becoming aggressive to other dogs. Say they're out on a leash walk in the neighborhood, always has been fine seeing other dogs, and growls when another dog comes around the corner. And then two days later, it's a growl bark. And then another dog runs up to it who we used to be okay with, and it's a growl bark pounce, right, or lunge or something. And I'll I'll never forget the first time this happened. It was obviously a long time ago, but I was talking to these clients. They were telling me, and we were like 25 minutes into the interview. And they said, well, you know, we go to the dog park twice a week, and he loves it there, and he's always fine. And I said, has anything ever happened there? And they said, well, you know, there was this big, huge Labrador mix who ran over and sort of rolled him over, and um, he was fine. He wasn't injured. It was okay. He was fine, and nothing happened. We took him back the next day, and he was fine. And then the next time, he wasn't. He was a little not fine, and the next time, he was less fine. And so one of the things about trauma is that it very often, you don't see the results of it until later because the brain is actually making physical changes over time. It's actually trying to figure out what happened and changing in a way to deal with it. So I know with me, like I had like no responses to some of the things that happened to me until time went on, you know, and I can still get triggered. Something happened a couple of weeks ago that set me back. And I was fine for a while. And then all of a sudden I wasn't. And because I know, you know, I know myself and I know the symptoms, I was like, oh my goodness, that happened five days ago, right? So that's a very long answer to one very short aspect about how to figure it out. So one is to understand that an event and trauma, you don't always see the results of it right away. So the dog can be fine after the dog fight, right? Right but not a week later. So that's part of it. I don't know. What do you think? Mm, Do you have that experience? Yeah, that's, you know, such an interesting thing to think about because if a change in behavior happens, we're often jumping to something else, right? So medical, new medical issue, new pain issue, social maturity, development, adolescence, developmental periods, you know, and we, we often jump into those, but we sometimes forget maybe it was that event that happened three days ago, three weeks ago, three months ago. Yeah. Yeah, And and it's so interesting. And it's, and you're right. It is very difficult to know, you know, what's happening there because the dogs can't tell us, right? Yeah. You know, it was that dog park experience from three days ago. Right. And the dog might not even know, you know, I mean, do dogs repress things? (laughs) I don't know. Right. Right. And that's that's why this, you know, conversation is so fascinating, but also important, you know, to, to kind of think through these things. So I think, I mean, one of the things I've seen a little bit of, and, you know, this is true in any business, basically, um, any field, it's just hard to take that much time. It's just hard to take that much time. But I really, if you really want to understand, you know, is it pain? Is it, you know, is it some developmental issue? Has its eyes changed because it's now seven months old and it can't see very well? You know, was there an event? Um, it just takes a tremendous amount of time. And I, I find... That's one of the biggest challenges of working with clients. I mean, I I don't do it anymore, but the entire time that I did, we're all the same. We want things fixed right away, right? You know, and I don't know if it's worse now than it was before. It seemed to me over the 25 years or so that I was seeing clients, it seemed like people wanted more quick fixes, more sort of the end of that period. Mm -hmm. I don't know. Do you find that challenging to sort of, help people understand that 
Uh, definitely. No. I mean, just in, yeah. in a case, even in cases where, it, you know, trauma or, or stress, uh, you know, overt stress is not significantly a factor. I mean, it's even difficult just in, you know, I, right. qu- air quotes, uh, right. standard <laughs> aggression cases, right? right. Yeah, right. yeah. And so in that regard, I kind of wanted to also ask, you know, strategies to sort of emphasize the need for patience and understanding with our dogs. If yeah. you were to, again, yeah. navigate those conversations on the human side, mm-hmm. what, would that, what would that look like for you? If you're trying to convince an arm, like, oh, I just want to get this fixed, or I think you yeah. know, so it must be, yeah. you know, just, you know, how they are, there's circuits wired wrong, or, you know, the typical things yeah. that people might or, say. Or I don't have time and I don't have money, you know? Mm. I mean, life, right? You know, I mean, it's so... I just have so much compassion for people who are strapped for time or energy or money and they love their dogs so much, yeah, you know, and it's like, ugh, can I deal with this? So I guess for to me, I love to hear what you say, but the first thing I do is I just feel so compassionate towards people who have come to us, you know, because they've come to us. Bless them, right? I mean, yay for them. You know, they're not shooting the dog. They're not... You know, doing what their grandfather said. They're not just, you know, throwing it away. Um, They're trying, right? And so the first thing I do is I sympathize. I empathize. I sympathize. Compassionate. I just, I like, I get it. I totally get it. If I had a magic wand, you know, we would figure this out today. We would solve it tomorrow. (laughs) You know, we we could deal with that. I don't know how to do that. There are some quick methods that some people use that I'm not comfortable with. You know, I mean... As we all know, punishment, one of the aspects of punishment that, that people who use it argue makes it more effective is that it's quick, right? It could be quick and it's fast, and a lot of people want quick and fast. So I'll talk about the downside of that, you know? Mm-hmm. Like you can stop your dog from growling by giving it a leash pop, but that doesn't change what's going on inside, and you just lost your warning system, right? So that's one thing I do. And then the other thing I do, and I think this is really important, I would always create some kind of progress, some step. So like one of the things I do, even though it had nothing to do with the issue, is I love to teach a stay. And I'm not even really asking them to use it that much. I want them to see how much control they can have over their dog without scaring it or touching it. But you can teach them to do it. And you send them out of your office feeling empowered. And because I think that's what they need. People feel... Don't you think people feel desperate and out of control and helpless? Absolutely. And if you give them a feeling of compassionate power, do you know what I mean? Absolutely. I think that that's one of the most important tools any trainer or consultant can possess is empathy. It's, mm-hmm. I think, probably trumps everything else. It's the most important yeah. thing when dealing with the clients, yeah. when working with the clients, because really it does start with the clients in our aggression cases because of all yeah. the emotions involved. Right, right. right. You earlier talked about shame, Mm -hmm. and that is so huge and so important. And I think, you know, you were saying empathy is so important, and I think a part of that empathy is helping people take the shame away. I mean, I've we actually talked about this in meditation class, about how a friend of mine got colleague, and she was talking about how guilty she felt. She was so ashamed. This is the most responsible, careful person. She has been so careful. She's practically isolated herself for three years, right? And she was still felt guilty. And people whose dogs who are aggressive, exceptions, of course, but in general, people feel so ashamed and so guilty. And I think taking that shame away, because shame is a really destructive emotion. It doesn't motivate you. It doesn't do anything but make you want to curl up and shrink and hide and be defensive, right? And so one of the things I tell people is that one of the first thing I'd say is like, you didn't bite anybody. Let's be clear here. <laughs> you did not bite anybody, <laughs> right? Um, and just talk about how, how one of the things I learned from therapy actually is um, how easy it is to feel guilty about something that happened because Feeling ashamed and guilty gives you the sense that, well, if I just done something different, well, if I hadn't done that, well, if I had done this, it wouldn't have happened. In other words, we're in control, right? In other words, it's still all about us. We can control what's happening. And if I had only done this or not done that, 
then it would be okay. And the fact is, we are dandelions in the wind, right? Hmm. I mean, of course, we have a lot of control over a lot of things, but stuff happens. It just does. And we are, you know, we are little tiny specks in the universe. <laughs> so trying to lift that burden to me feels really important. Yes, yes, it's a, such an important point because the, the self blame too is another characteristic I yeah. often see. It's is it yeah. my fault or is it something I'm doing wrong? And yeah. one of the best things yeah. we can do is really help alleviate those concerns because that right. can lead to the shame, you know, and, right. and, and the guilt. Yeah. And if we can step in and say, listen, we're all doing the best with the information we can, or we have rather, right. it's right. what the goal is, right? It's just because we right. can't control everything, right. like you said. What is Chris Pichel say that we're all doing the best we can mm -hmm. with the skills we have yep. in the circumstances we're in, right? And I've said that over and over and over to myself as well as to other people, right? Yes, yeah. Chris has so many wise sayings as well. Yeah. Yes, yes. Yeah. So a little bit more on the trauma aspect and, sure. and again, helping the dogs. Let's say we we're confirming to ourselves that a dog has experienced trauma. Okay. And we've got that patience and understanding piece in place. What are your thoughts on, you know, the behavior change strategies that are out there now with yeah. trauma in mind? So we, you know, we've talked plenty on the show about counter conditioning strategies, desensitization, right. enrichment, all of the typical right. things, but we don't right. talk a lot about the dogs that are have experienced trauma or are expressing aggression or aggressive behavior as a result in certain contexts, especially. Right. So what are right. some of your insights there? Yeah, yeah, thanks. I love that question. It's a great question because as somebody with PTSD, it's, here's the bottom line, safety. Hmm. Feeling in control. That it's the absolute bottom line. What happens to many of us anyway, I wouldn't say everybody, but it happens to many of us. So we feel like, you're talking about control and we don't have it, right? So this is sort of the other side of that, is that when, you know, when an individual is severely traumatized, what you end up with is a feeling of you never know what's going to happen. The two things that were, in a way, hardest for me to get over physiologically, not necessarily emotionally, but physiologically, were one, having a man fall from five stories and land at my feet and die. Mm -hmm. And the other is actually not in the education of Will. The editor asked me to take it out. She said, mm -hmm. it's too much. People can't handle it. So I will just yeah. warn people. There's a trigger warning coming here. This is a very difficult moment of my life. You know, you might want to just edit it out or you might want to just turn away if you're listening. But I was in one of those fun houses, and I am using air quotes on purpose now. Mm -hmm. I was in one of those fun houses at a state fair with uh, my girlfriend, and it was one of those pitch dark, you know, like you can't see your hand. It's absolute, complete pitch dark. And then the, you know, scary witch statue would come out and yell at you, you know, and you're sort of walking along in the pitch dark. And what I now understand to be three young men leapt out, grabbed me, threw me down, pulled my pants off, raped me, and then stole our purses and then ran away. And the reason those two things were so hard is that they were completely out of the blue. So the reason I'm telling you those stories is that when things happen out of the blue, they are almost always harder to deal with. And that's if you look at people who have been in serious car accidents, for example, if they're hit from behind and they didn't see it, they have a higher rate of getting PTSD. You know, about 30% of car accident victims get some version of PTSD, but it's the ones who didn't see it coming. So when you think of it that way, then you have this individual who never knows when doom is going to fall. And ironically, the response to that, I had it, and I think millions of individuals have it, is to try and feel a sense of predictability. So getting back to dogs, that's what's so important, is a sense of safety and predictability. So for weeks and months and maybe years afterwards, they need to know that they can predict what's going to happen around them. They need to know that you will protect them. They need to know that they have some control over their life. So creating safe spaces where nobody bothers them, where they really feel safe, having routines where they can predict things that happen, I think that's really important. Never putting them in a position where you're going too far too fast. Never just figuring, oh, well, they'll be okay. And it sort of sounds like I'm talking about kid gloves, but in a way it is, you know? Um, yeah. So yeah. does that make sense? Yeah, absolutely. And and first of all, I... I 
truly am sorry for yeah, what thanks. happened. And, and I really <laughs> yeah. appreciate you, your vulnerability here yeah. and sharing that experience and, you know, all the other things you've had to survive. So, yeah, I mean, you talk about predictability, you talk about safety. And, and I was going to actually ask you that because, and then you yeah. actually answered my question <laughs> for me is, yeah. is predictability yeah. so important? And, um, and it, it resonates with me completely, you know, in, in yeah. my own experiences yeah. in my own life, as well as with dogs, Yeah, you know, yeah. because I think advocacy too is really the word when we're talking about our dogs, because we have to love do that. a lot of, you know, we're in control of the environment most of the time for them as best yeah, we can. They're helpless. Right? Yeah. And yeah. so, you know, versus us as people, we sometimes have much more choice about what we can right. do in our lives. But for our dogs, right. we really need to advocate. And we have to, th we, we're often kind of thinking on this macro level of, Okay, let's just avoid the dog park or let's avoid, you know, right. going into this particular super scary location. But yeah, it can yeah. often manifest in much more micro ways. And that's the thing about dogs too. They're so quick to latch on to different associations in the environment. Like, oh, that garbage can there to us is like, oh, garbage can, you know, what's the big deal right. about the garbage can? But that garbage can could have been there on the day that they experienced that traumatic event. Right. And so those are right. the sort of micro details we need to parse out for our dogs and advocate for them in those subtle ways because most of us often are cognizant of the big details right right so. right yeah no i think that's so important that whole issue of safety predictability and the other one that you touched on that i think is so important is agency you know is autonomy is when can you safely give your dog more autonomy and one of the things that i love about the dog training world right now just oh it makes me so happy because i you know when i started Everything was a leash jerk. I mean, yeah. that was it, right? And I just, oh, it just makes me so happy to see so many really smart, thoughtful people understanding. You know, and it's the whole universe starting to understand the minds and the lives of other animals now. It's just so heartening. But it also puts responsibility on us, right? You know, now that we know, right? It does. A lot more about the emotional life of, for example, our dogs. And so, one of the biggest challenges I see with a lot of companion dogs in the United States is a lack of autonomy, yes. you know, is a lack of freedom. And you know, I'm really lucky. I live in the country. We have land. I mean, my dogs are on leash to go to the vet. <laughs> <You know? Yeah. laughs> and still, there are times I just want to go inside, right? So it's like, Skip, go hurry up, which means go poop, please. <laughs> That's his cue is hurry yeah. up because it's, you know, Wisconsin. <laughs> so, and I know there are times he'd rather be outside longer. So he still doesn't have the kind of agency or autonomy that a street dog, frankly, mm -hmm. has, right. you know, or that we have, right? So I think creating situations, and I see more and more of that happening. I know you're doing it or giving, you know, and, the, you know, the bucket game, right? You know, yeah. giving dogs autonomy and agency where they can call the shots more and not in a not in a spoiled way, but just because they're sentient individuals who have a life, right? Absolutely. And I and I love that you're talking about this because, you know, I, I, I we were talking before the show and I, I mentioned I had just gotten off with uh, Dr. Mark Beckoff and yes. recording his episode, uh, which is probably going to be out a little later than if anybody's listening in, into yours right now. But we were talking very similar lines of just this, the need for agency and the, the lack of it in yeah, the cases yeah. we're seeing. And perhaps maybe that's why we're seeing an increase in aggression in some of these these environments where we're so restrictive on the dog's movements and, and their natural yeah, autonomy it, and agency. Yeah. I mean, everybody who's been to Europe, right? Yep. Right? You know, mm -hmm. we were in downtown London at one of the huge parks there, mm -hmm. you know, and the dogs were unleashed down the sidewalk, down, you know, by the busy roads. And as soon as they got in these fenced, massive parks, you know, of course they were off leash, you know? And, you know, we walked for miles and miles and miles in Scotland. It was, you know, no dogs, you know, we went to yeah. the seashore and it was a, sort of a national forest kind of area. There was no you're in a national forest, you have to leash your dog, right? Mm -hmm. So yeah, so I think our dogs really do suffer from a lack of that. I think I I think I might be a little bitey. <laughs> <laughs> if, if, you know, if I if my life felt so constrained. Yeah. Yeah, you know? absolutely. Absolutely. That that frustration and just lack of enrichment and there's so many variables. Yeah. 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 
So we're going to take a short break to hear a word from our sponsor, and we'll be back to talk more about emotions and a lot of other deep details into this conversation. So we'll see you back here in a few seconds. In lieu of the typical mid-episode sponsored ad you usually hear in the bitey end of the dog, given the important focus of this conversation, I would like to ask you to consider donating to the RCC in Madison, Wisconsin. The RCC advocates for those harmed by sexual violence by centering survivors, promoting societal change, and committing to be an evolving force for social equity. Serving Dane County since 1973, the RCC, formerly the Rape Crisis Center, is a nonprofit organization that provides services to survivors and their support people of all forms of sexual violence, including recent sexual assault, past sexual assault, incest, sexual harassment, and sexual exploitation. You can find a link to donate on their website, thercc.org, that's thercc.org, and you can also find the link in the show notes for this episode. Thank you for your consideration and for listening to this episode. All right. I'm back with Dr. Patricia McConnell. We've been having a really, really great chat about how we can help dogs, how we can understand people. So, you know, I, I want to kind of keep diving into both of those details about, you know, helping people, helping animals. But one of the topics now too, sort of related to, well, very related to trauma is abuse with dogs or abuse with people too. So first I do, again, we're going to give another content warning. We might be discussing topics that may be triggering for some. So please be aware of that as you're listening to the show. But first I'd like to start off by defining abuse because that is another topic mm. or, or label that we need to have a clear definition to, to have a clear conversation on, I think. You know, nobody's ever asked me that question. I find myself wanting to throw that back to you. It's a great question, and nobody's ever asked me that before. I'm going to ponder it for a minute, and I, I, I want to hear what you have to say, because it's a really good question, because I think that's a little bit like stress and trauma, and that it can be thrown out with such a broad meaning that eventually it become meaningless, right? Yeah, and and I'm the same way. I I don't think I've found a very standard definition, right? It's sort of like aggression, depending on who you ask. Yeah, They're going right. to see a lot of different definitions right. for it. Yeah. And I think for me, it really is dependent on the, the individual, their interpretation mm. of what it is they're experiencing and whether they find it mm -hmm. abusive or not to themselves. So because some people you know, might actually find something reinforcing that others might consider abusive in some situations. That's, that's a really, really good point. I love that perspective. So basically what you're saying is it's defined by the receiver, <laughs> sort of like reinforcement, <laughs> sort of uh, defined by the receiver. Yes. And I can think of so many examples of that. Just, I was at a training seminar um, in which some of the methods, it was a sheepdog training seminar, some of the methods being used, I was not comfortable with. And it was really clear that there was, they were punishment oriented. Um, no dog was ever hurt. However, I'm sure that some people would consider it abusive. Some people wouldn't. But what I can tell you is that the dogs responded with tremendous variation. It had little visible effect on some dogs. And there were other dogs who were clearly frightened. So I, I really like your perspective. It's like, what, you know, what impact is that having? You know? Yeah. And so in that regard... I think it's very much the perception of the person, right? So that's also observing it. So we, we perceive yes. the learner or the, the yes. sentient being experiencing something. And based on what we're seeing, their body language, right. well, let's use dogs, for example, their body language, their behavior, their physiological signs, the, yeah. their behavior after right. those moments. And we can kind of extrapolate what we think might be abusive. But the reason I'm going down this is I think it's important to to clarify what this is, because in some of the conversations that are happening in the dog training community are, right. some will look at something as abusive and others are actually using those techniques or tools to right. employ in their dog training and they don't think they're abusive and they right. take a lot of offense to being called abusers. Right. So we can talk about different tools, but let's use something that's maybe less polarizing. Maybe let's use a squirt bottle, right? So yeah. instead of going all the way down yeah. hit either way, sure. let's just yeah. use, let's use a squirt bottle, for instance. And right. so some dogs right. maybe 
you know, you spray them and they just completely melt. Like, and we, they're, you know, right. tail tucks, they scatter, they, right. everything right goes the down. Room. And then anytime they even see right. anybody holding anything, they're just, they're right. out of there. And right. then some dogs, you know, we might see like a Labrador be like, yeah, squirt me some more. Open, <laughs> let me open my mouth and you can squirt me in the mouth. Right. <laughs> right. And so right. that's kind of an example. I think it's, again, I'm leaving the other tools off the table for now, but I think hopefully this will serve as a good example for the talking point. Yeah. But I think it's our perceptions. And, and and I also will dig into, you know, what our experiences yeah. is that shape our perceptions. But right. so what are your thoughts there so right. far? So I guess one of the things I find myself thinking is, and this relates to something we could talk about forever, which is the divisiveness that seems to... Mm -hmm. pervade the dog training community. I mean, I talk to, you know, people who are in it, I say, yeah, it's sort of like, you know, politics right now. Mm -hmm. you know? There's just a lot of very strongly held feelings right now, right? And so I guess where I am is I try to avoid words like that. I just don't find them helpful. You know, so somebody said, is something you do abusive? And like, you know, I think a good answer is to not answer that question, except to answer it in a different way. So, you know, I guess my own thought is I think we need to be careful of those words that are so divisive, basically, and so emotionally laden. Because if you have been abused, you know, that's a pretty emotionally laden word, right? Yes. Yes. And I think... You know, kind of the next direction I wanted to ask you too, along those lines of what you were just saying is, yeah. you know, somebody that has experienced abuse, and let's say it's been something physical, right. and that they're witnessing something that reminds them of that, that's being done to dogs. Mm -hmm. I can understand that. I can empathize with that, you know, of course. going through of that course. myself as well, and seeing something physically happening to another person or being mm -hmm. or animal it evokes those emotions, right? I think it is a word we have to be careful with in understanding that side of the equation as well. I don't know if I have a question. I think I'm just thinking out loud here. I mean, what are your, what are your thoughts? Yeah, I well, you know, you're reminding me, a friend of mine um, talks about how she was, and I don't want to use the word abused, but she was basically something, ha her father did something to her that came out of the blue, was relatively violent, absolutely terrified her. And, and she talks about it in terms of dog training and basically says, I have never forgotten that. I've never, ever forgotten that. So she's using the concept of trust. And I think that's a place mm -hmm. for us to go, is how much trust does your dog have in you? How much trust do you want your dog to have in you? You know, she said, once it's lost, you can never completely get it back. Mm -hmm. And I think there's some truth to that. You know, there's some writers about trauma who talk about how once, once something sort of earth-shaking happens, like with me, once that guy fell literally from the sky and died at my feet, it's like you can never take that away from your brain, right? You can never not wonder unconsciously if something like that is going to happen again. And so her her comment about dog training is if you really physically go after your dog, if you truly scare, hurt, or injure your dog, you're never going to take that back, you know? So don't do it. You know? mm -hmm. Once you lose that kind of trust, once you never trust the world is going to be completely safe, once you never trust a particular person to be there for you, it's really hard to recover, you know? Yeah. It's very, very true. It's a good argument of why we have to be so careful with any kind of punishers or aversives, right. and especially right. when mixing those in with reinforcers, right? Because it creates such right. unpredictability. Exactly. Right, for the dog. Exactly. And potentially impacting that trust you were talking about. Exactly. And you know, and now you're leading me down a different path related. But a really important one, and we're sort of going back to guilt, we're sort of circling back mm -hmm. around to guilt and shame. I don't know many people, and I know there are some, and you might be one of them, I don't know, who are perfect around their dogs all the time. There are times in my life, you know, I am, I am generally a very patient person, I'm generally a very nice person, but I have had moments when I was exhausted and tired and stressed 
And I'm recalling throwing a coffee cup across the room because my computer was screwing up. <laughs> I was going after my dog. I, you know, I don't go after my dog, but I know that scared my dogs, mm -hmm. right? And now it's like, oh, she's a person who could do that, right? And then, of course, there's all the guilt and the shame, you know? Mm -hmm. And so, and especially with people who have been traumatized, sometimes it's hard to regulate those kind of emotions or, you know, abuse. And I saw so many clients, again, circling back to where we started, who felt so guilty and so ashamed because they weren't perfect. And so I think on the one hand, we have this really interesting meditative kind of balance we have to create, which is which is always being cognizant of how important it is to keep the trust of our dogs and to be compassionate and forgiving to ourselves because we're not perfect, you know? Mm -hmm. And that's a balance to hold all the time, right? To hold and to think about and sort of live with and make peace with. Yeah. Gosh, so many things <laughs> going through my mind right now. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, you know, I mean, have you ever... I mean, I'm putting you on the spot here, but but have you ever like yelled at the TV or, you know, done something and then you, you went like, oh, shoot, you know? Yeah. Oh, yeah, definitely. Yeah. Definitely. Yeah. yeah. Who has it? <laughs> I almost, I mean. I think there are people who don't, but they're not yeah. very, good, very <laughs> well, few. The funny thing between. is like, we you know, every time I've heard you speak or read your stuff, you know, I, I just, yeah. you know, I think of you as one of the nicest people on the planet <laughs> in my eyes, you know? No, <laughs> I mean, I, you know, that is, that is a part of me, you know, mm -hmm. and I, I want to be a truly kind, compassionate, generous person. And most of the time I am, but I'm not always, you know, mm -hmm. I'm not. And, yeah. and that's one of the burdens. I mean, you, you know, you're going to have that more and more too, is that people expect you to always be that person. And I am almost always that mm -hmm. person, but I'm not always yeah. that person. Yeah. And I think I always, I was just writing actually. Something else. Um, actually, I was writing, I was working on my novel, and I was writing a section on um, somebody who got violent and said, oh, that's just not me. You know how people say like, oh, that's, that's not me. It's like, yeah, it is. It's just right. not the part of you you like, right? You know, we all have many parts of us. And I do think forgiving ourselves is just just so important. And rather than judging, just being curious. It's like, oh, wow, why did I do that? You know, being just being curious is just, it saved me from so much. I think it's the one of the most important sort of mental strategies that we can have is, you know, you start getting frustrated. Well, be curious. Well, what's going on? Why? Well, what can I do about it? You know, what is my, I have a border collie now, Skip, who's six years old. He has a habit he came with three years ago. I have never been able to completely change it. There are times I get frustrated with him and it helps me profoundly to be like, well, why now, but not yesterday, you know? Mm. So curiosity is is our savior, I think. <laughs> yes. Spoken like a you know? true ethologist as well. Yes. <laughs> you know, just, yeah. you know, a behavior observation is so crucial to understanding, you know, not just looking at, at that right moment. You have to observe it over time right. to really get yeah. a good data yeah. sample, right? To, to understand right. those nuances, you yeah. know? Yeah, yeah. So I'd love to kind of tie everything together now and what we're talking about with helping dogs, helping people, the trauma, the abuse that some have experienced, you know, and you were talking about predictability and that again resonated with me because mm. it takes me back to my situation, yeah. you know, so my story, which I really haven't talked to, I don't think I've ever mentioned it on any, in any public forum, but here goes. So good for you. Yeah. So when I was much younger, I, you know, had a relationship, I ended up having my first son really young. So I started early. I was 23 at the time, but I was in this relationship and I was with somebody that was very manipulative, but also would switch to being extremely, you know, uh, just nice and sweet. And then suddenly this manipulative, really awful, abusive behavior would surface. And so in a way, I've learned a lot of resilience. I've, I've developed a lot of resiliency for frustration because it was so incredibly frustrating because, you know, I had my son at the time yeah. Yeah. and um, his mother was abusive to him, just long periods of neglect so and just sorry. locking uh -oh. him in a closet and just oh, really awful things. Oh, so sorry. Yeah. It just, it was, you know, so many, so many traumatic events, you know, she had created stories that, of me assaulting her and she was so good at manipulating people 
she could have the police eating out of her hand and like oh, you know God, and so, so i was arrested twice you know falsely and thankfully she was having one of her bad days and this is when we went to court and that completely cleared everything because uh, you know it just became obvious to the judge yeah exactly I was like, Phew. Phew. Yeah. which then allowed me to get sole custody of my son and get him out of the abusive situation as well but it really impacted me going forward because I needed that predictability in my relationships. I needed to move away from this unstableness and uh, I didn't recognize it at the time. And I think um, it also has profoundly impacted how I interact with my kids and mm -hmm. the dogs that I work with um, mm -hmm. and making sure that they do feel safe and that they do feel that things can be predictable. But I had didn't realize until I really read your book or listened to your book and mm -hmm. it everything was like, poof, makes wow. total wow. sense yeah. to me now yeah. and there's still some things i think i need to unpack after listening to your book but i think also you know what i mean when there's some missing connections I there do. it just it just put it together so thank you for for writing your book oh well yeah. mike thank you first of all thank you for sharing that story and for being brave and being bravely vulnerable one quick thing i want to say not about dogs but your story, a family member of mine went through the same thing for actually 20 years. His wife was abusive. And finally, finally, the cops came. And this time, it was the exact same scenario. Finally, they were like, oh, oh, wait, it's not him, right? It's not the guy this time. And I don't know how common it is, but it's obviously a lot more common than people think. So one, thank you for telling that story, because I think it's so important for men to be given respect and belief. But then what a gift, you know, this horrible thing that happened to you. And it breaks my heart to hear it. I could actually cry right now. I won't, but I could easily. It breaks my heart. But what a gift in a way that you have taken that experience and used it to help so many dogs and so many people, you know, and the fact that that's in part, even unconsciously sort of driving what you do, it's just bittersweetly beautiful, you know, it's sort of sadly beautiful. So you've turned this horrible thing that happened to you in this wonderful, wonderful gift that you're giving to the world. So thank you. Thank you. And and thanks to all of the trainers also that are out there because I think I think a lot of us have gotten into the dog training community because people have let us down in other parts of our life. And so a lot of us will figure out that eventually we hey, we do actually have to work with people in this field, but we sometimes like, let me gravitate towards the animals because they're not gonna hurt me. They're not gonna let me down. So anybody listening in, resonating with some of the things Trish and I are talking about, um, thank you for um, you know all the work you're doing with animals to help animals and their people, right? Yeah, yeah, no, we're all animals, right? And we're all in this mm -hmm. together, this bond that this magical, magical evolutionary story that we have with dogs it's it's there's just nothing like it you know and so the magic goes on you know them teaching us us, us teaching them and us sort of moving through time and space in this incredibly emotional you know strong physical mental emotional experience that we're having with another species it's just there's just nothing like it on earth and aren't we lucky to be a part of it yes yes I think that's a good way to wrap up the topic, but I do want to talk about what you've got coming out next as well, because you're an unbelievable author and avid writer. So what are you working on now? What can we expect from you next? I am, just this morning, I was writing one of the last chapters of my first draft of a mystery novel. And of course there are dogs. <laughs> of course there are dogs. Um, there's also trauma in it. Um, mm. Not shockingly, right? Mm -hmm. But it's really fun. I've never written fiction. I've never written a mystery. I had no idea what I was doing when I was starting. So I'm working on that. It will be forever till it comes out. But I'm having great fun with it, really, really fun with it. So what I am writing and, and putting out into the world is my blog, which is The Other End of the Leash, otherendoftheleash.com. Um, you can just go to my website, patriciamcconnell.com, and my blog is there. And I'm on Facebook, which is a really interesting community. Basically, there's sort of two separate villages. They're very different. Their personalities are very different. But I'm enjoying them immensely. You know, really, I love talking to people all around the world. And so that's what's keeping me busy sort of 
writing that's going out into the world. So thanks for asking. Just just Google my name and you'll end up there. Wonderful. And I'll be sure to link to all of that in the show notes as well for you guys. Thank and, you. and definite kudos to the other end of the leash blog. I, you know, it's been around for, for quite some time now. And it is just packed with unbelievable resources thank and you. information thank in you. nice bite sized chunks, too, you know, in yeah, understandable thank you. ways. And then there's podcasts like this. <laughs> which are just a wonderful addition. So I appreciate yeah. that. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So lots of different ways to learn. And it's just, it's a great thing to see with our community. So Trisha, thank you so much for joining me. This has been an incredible conversation and I hope to see you again in the future. Me too. Thank you. <laughs> 